Hello, everybody. Welcome to this live Euronews YouTube debate here on Euronews YouTube channel. My name is Jeremy Wilkes. I host a program called Climate Now on Euronews, and we are here to talk about our warming planet and what we're going to do about it with this extraordinary excellent panel that you have in front of you here. It's been quite a week for climate change with new promises of emissions reductions from US President Joe Biden. We also had the publication of the Copernicus European State of the Climate Report, which makes for pretty sobering reading on the true state of planet Earth. So we're gonna talk about the facts on climate change, talk about the strategies, the policies and some of the science and answer your questions. So please put them in the chat there and send them over to us and we will be able to put them to the experts here. Let me introduce everybody. We have Bas Eikut, who's a member of the European Parliament, a Dutch politician from the Green Left Party and Vice President of the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety. We have Dr. Kirsten Dunlop, CEO of the EIT Climate Kick or Knowledge and Innovation Community, um, who is working to accelerate the transition to a zero carbon and climate resilient society. Dr. Carlo Bontempo, who's the director of the Copernicus Climate Change Service, Europe's leading source of data on the true state of the planet. Tim McPhee, spokesperson for climate action and energy at the European Commission, and Professor Sonia Sinivaratni from the Institute of Atmospheric and Climate Science at ETH Zurich and an IPCC co-author. Thanks everybody for being with us here. Um, when we look back at what happened in 2020, it was one of the third warmest years on record. It came at the end of the warmest decade on record. And I'm wondering, Carlo, are we at a climate tipping point already now? Are we about to kind of switch into a new dramatic world of climate change? Well, uh, thank you, Jeremy, for the question. A very interesting question. I, I wouldn't call it a tipping point. If you look at the standard definition of a tipping point, 2020 wasn't a tipping point. Nevertheless, we have seen in this uh, last uh, year a number of events that per se are quite extraordinary. So if, for instance, you look at the global map uh, of temperature in 2020, you see a large anomaly uh, in uh, in the Siberia, in the uh, Arctic Siberia. with temperature yeah, that red patch up there. <laughs> yeah, that red patch on, on, the, on the top of the figure. And you, there, you, you probably remember that because we covered it in this program uh, over the summer. Um, there was uh, one station that reported 10, 38 degrees uh, in uh, in the Arctic Circle. That's you know there, it goes without saying that that's unusual. But if you look at, at the annual basis, we have seen in that region anomalies of the order of six degrees, which are uh, incredibly large. So, so it's not six degrees warmer than average across the entire year in Siberia. Well, in, in a certain part of Siberia, yes, that, that's the case. Wow. wow. That sounds very, very serious. And we've also had this week, as I mentioned, these political promises. Um, how significant are they? Bas, what, what do you think? How significant are these? Is the US coming back in and making these climate promises? Well, I think most significant is that the United States is back uh, on the world stage and, and whether we like it or not, but we need them. We need the United States. It's the second uh, emitting economy in the world uh, after China. So uh, if they don't do climate change policies, Europe can do whatever we want, but they need to act as well. And at the same time, we've also seen this week that they are capable of bringing more countries at the table again. And I think European Union is absolutely leading at the legislative front, but you know, the United States is, is more leading at the diplomatic and the, the power politics. And I think both are required. And in that sense, it's very good that the United States is back there. Uh, Kirsten, I'd like to bring in you. What's your view on how the situation we are in, uh, taking into account the science, but then also taking into account the politics? Uh, I would say challenging. Um, very A major shift in terms of positive signals going in the right direction, both political and in the European context in terms of policy, but still a massive gap between where we're at on the ground and, and probably two things that are challenging. One is the extent to which we're moving at the speed we need um, and at the scale we need. We're still tending to think in terms of individual projects, finance is still looking for bankable projects, still waiting for things that will make a financial return. We're still, we've still got 
a tendency to think in terms of sectors and silos. We're not really addressing this yet widespread in really systemic terms, and yet we know the scale of change we need is systemic. We need to change whole cities and whole value chains. Um, and I'd say in a European context where there is, as Baz just, just mentioned, a massively positive enabling set of conditions in terms of the policy intention, we still, however, ha have a set of frameworks for how to deploy public investment in that kind of change that are not fit for purpose. And that is a challenge. We've got to change some of the ways in which we deploy funding and the way in which we take decisions if we want to make the action match the, the intentions. What do you think that we need to do then? Uh, I mean, what's the, the if you could pick out just a couple of things there in terms of those systemic changes, you're saying change is the way we, we're thinking, but it takes ages to change the way people think about problems. Well, it does. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. It depends on, on how many elements you're kind of working with. Um, I mean, if I start from the really low hanging fruit and, you know, just take one systemic problem, we've got the right and the left hand doing two things, separate things. So on the right, we've got a, you know, on the one hand, we're saying we want carbon neutral by 2050. We've just literally finalised a massive step forward in terms of the Fit for 55 by getting to 55% reductions in carbon emissions relative to 1990 by 2030. There are many of us who feel it needs to be much bolder than that, but it's a major step forward. Um, but we're still subsidising fossil fuels. We've still got pensions, pension funds with massive investments in high carbon emitting businesses because on the balance of evidence, it's still where money can make a return. So that, if, that contradiction is a, a starting point. If we can't rule out the contradictions, we've got a problem. We've just published in Europe a taxonomy on, on sustainable finance, which was going in a fantastically scientific advised direction, working on science-based targets and evidence-based policy, and has just deviated at the last minute on bioeconomy and on forestry. And we just can't afford to keep doing that. If Tim, that Tim, can I bring in you on, on this one? Because you're really in, in the heart of the machine here in Brussels. And um, by the sounds listening to, to Kirsten, uh, he says we're not doing enough in Europe. Um, well, I think you can you can make the case that we're we're not doing enough anywhere in the world. Um, but I think Europe is is very much um, in the lead. I think I think Bass alluded to this as well. I mean, in terms of the the legislative framework that we've put in place, that we're putting in place, um, we're very much a, a world leader. And we have now in the climate law, which was agreed at five a.m. Wednesday morning. Um, that was a, a nice night for for some of us. Um, you know, we've put into law now this the 2030 target, the minus 55. We have the 2050 target, and also moving towards negative emissions beyond that. So, you know, we're we're just over a year into this um, new commission mandate. We've got a, a whole stack of legislation, a dozen proposals, um, which are going to come in this summer. So, you know, it's it's a bit like an oil tanker. You don't turn it around overnight, but I think we're we're definitely moving in the right direction. And of course, you know, policy, um, there's always going to be somebody that thinks you're not doing enough and somebody that thinks you're, you're doing too much. And the commission's role is to try and, you know, put together legislation, which is well impact assessed, which takes into account the just transition. Um, but of course, you know, fundamentally, the number one priority is, is the science and, and what that says we need to do on climate and environment. So I think we're, you know, we're, we're very much going in the right direction. Um, and I think we, we're, you know, we're trying to bring the rest of the world with us. And, you know, the US joining the party again this week is definitely a good sign. I, I, when it comes to turning around oil tankers, obviously we're all kind of slightly obsessed with the COVID-19 pandemic, which seems to have been trundling on like an oil tanker for a very long time and taking a long time to turn around as well. During that time, of course, emissions of CO2 into the atmosphere continued. They did go down a tiny bit, but it wasn't really particularly measurably helpful. This is a graphic we have from Copernicus showing how those atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations go up. Sonia, what, when you see something like this, what are you thinking? Uh, what, what are you thinking in relation to the IPCC conclusions about the state of our planet? Yeah, so I mean, this is uh, consistent with what we know about the climate system. The fact is that CO2 has a very long lifetime. So once it's emitted, it stays there for hundreds to thousands of years. So that's the main problem we are facing. Again, the COVID uh, crisis did reduce emissions a little bit, but all together it was only about 7% reduction in total. And then, of course, since CO2 accumulates, we basically continue to have an increase in CO2 concentration. And that's why we need to get to net zero. I think that's the main message we need to say. We need basically to have zero input of CO2 to the air 
And I think this uh, figure also shows it. I'm going to bring in some of the questions we've had from uh, Instagram. Uh, Min for mice, what I think is might be one way of pronouncing that handle. Um, what should be the main points of, for the EU to work on in terms of getting towards carbon neutrality? What should we be focusing on? Because there's lots of things that we could be doing. What are the big things that we should focus on now? Um, who wants to have a go answering that one? Shall I have a go at it? Go for it. Because I think I, I'm here right in the middle between Tim and Kirsten, and I think that's also right the setting where I feel comfortable, to be very honest, because um, when Tim is saying, like, well, it's the role of the Commission, right, to find a bit the middle ground, and some are not happy in, uh, on the one side and not happy on the other side, and that's the place to be, well, excuse me, the Commission has promised that uh, the entire climate agenda would be a man on the moon project for Europe. We don't get a man on the moon project by consensus. So we need also a bit more from the Commission, a bit more this leading voice, this leading voice on things really need to change. And this is indeed where I agree with Kirsten. I think one of the fundamental things that we really need to change within Europe is our investment agenda. Europe is really good in legislation, so you can expect in June a package where we will see an increase in the carbon price. You will see an increase in standards, in target setting. That's all good and well, but the we need an investment agenda for infrastructure, energy infrastructure. Think of transport infrastructure. This kind, these kind of investments are so desperately needed. And there we still have too much, 27 different countries doing their own thing, don't like too much a European coordination of that. And that needs to change. That drastically needs to change. And also this idea that budget cuts, eh, austerity, that's been kind of a German obsession with that we should not spend too much because we don't can't afford that. These are the changes that are needed. And that's a debate that we need to start in Europe, but needs to land in the different capitals of the EU. And there is still our biggest problem. But um, as, as Kirsten said, we do tend to think in silos, in sectors and things. As I say, oh, the cement industry is heavily polluting. What can we do to improve that? Or, you know, heavy industry in another direction or transport, which love, lots of people love to talk about. Is there one of those that we should say, yeah, let's let's we can fix that one pretty quickly? Well, I think what we can pretty quickly fix is, of course, the energy sector. But then again, the big challenge here is infrastructure do connect all the different possibilities of renewables. We have the potential, but we are not connecting it. So there is a quick fix if we can get that infrastructure done. I think on uh, our industry, I think Europe is at the good spot to really come to a first zero carbon industry. That means a lot of innovation, but that we can do. And I think on transport, uh, I think there the, the the, the rate of change is really, when we were discussing CO2 standards a couple of years ago, we can laugh at them right now because the reality has surpassed everything that we discussed as a, at the political level. And I think that we will keep on seeing the coming years. I think the you biggest challenge, if I may, if I may yeah, the well. biggest challenge is really housing. Our, our housing, if you look at the houses in the EU, they, they are still heating up outside air to a large extent. And this massive, really massive isolation and, and deep renovation agenda, the Commission is talking about it, but getting that done, that's really going to be a big challenge. You were just talking about the kind of reality possibly overtaking the agenda but I'm, and I'm wondering about the climate situation when it comes to that because we saw Arctic sea ice uh, re reaching its second lowest level last year. Uh, sea levels continue to rise and they will do even if we stop emitting CO2 straight away and I'm concerned as well that, you know, we, that we're already moving towards a 1.5 degree world. Carlo, is, is that the case? We're sort of already nearly at this 1.5 that we talk about in the Paris Agreement? Well, no, uh, we are not at 1.5 yet. Uh, there is still uh, some some uh, wiggle room. Uh, we have uh, at the moment we are around 1.2. Uh, but I guess what is interesting is the direction of travel. So there are a number of ways in which we can monitor the progress towards uh, uh, 1.5, and the progress is uh, relentless. So now it, it keeps uh, it keeps uh, going up, and it's not a surprise. We understand the science very well. The physics uh, behind is uh, uh, century old. Um, so it's, it's not really rocket science. Um, it's, it's quite straightforward, the basic of it. Uh, and 
fundamentally depends on the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And we were talking about, you know, what Sonia was saying before, you know, that some of these greenhouse gases, uh, CO2 in particular, have a very long uh, uh, lifetime in the atmosphere. So unless we do something about it, then uh, uh, this is not going to change. So there won't be uh, any any surprise immediately. We won't see a reduction in that in that relentless rise until we do something about the, the greenhouse gases. But you, you as a scientist, in your heart of hearts, do you, do you think the 1.5 degree Agree goal that the politicians talk about is attainable. Well, I guess this is a very challenging question. Uh, I think it's important to have figures, to have a threshold, and these are important not just for science. So, in a sense, for science, there is nothing particularly important of one, about 1.5. It can be 1.6, it can be 1.7. Doesn't matter that much whether it's exactly 1.5. I think it's important to have an agreed target and work towards that. So, in that sense, for me, 1.5 is a useful mechanism for for dialogue between scientists and policymakers more than a, a specific threshold of the climate system. A question we just had from um, uh, Paula Bernal, who's saying, do you think we're doing enough to damage to the environment, the speed of the destruction, the pollution? Can we mitigate or reverse uh, this this situation with the actual targets, with the targets that we have now? Um, are the targets that we have now kind of still relevant, I suppose, um, uh, uh, Kirsten, uh, uh, or should we be fixing quite different targets? So I don't think we're doing enough. We know we're not doing enough. That is a categorical issue. Um, I, if I can connect that question to your question around what should we be focusing on, I think we are at a point where we're realizing it's like you play a soccer game and we're beyond the end of the game. We're kind of well beyond the final piece. We're in penalty shootouts and we're kind of not even there. Um, so at this point, what we should be focusing on is everything. It's not one thing or another thing. It's the combination of effects that helps us change the whole, change entire cities and change entire agricultural regions. And it's not just a question of how do we substitute high carbon emitting ways of living. It's a question of changing the way we're living to change our demand for high carbon emitting practices and to look at how do we regenerate. I think one of the things we and this is probably the interesting quick question around 1.5, we have to regenerate, not just kind of flatten out and plateau, how do we manage to keep living more or less as we're living, but just substitute in a whole set of other technolo technological solutions to the way in which we produce carbon. We need to fundamentally restructure the way in which we're using resources and the relationship we have with, with the physical environment and with our own social dynamics around it. So. And in the work that, for example, EIT Climate Kick is doing, which is very much part of the Commission's agenda on systemic approaches and the man on the moon, the kind of the notion of moonshots, is really starting with the problem and working back from it. So starting, with, for example, with whole cities like the city of Madrid or the city of Amsterdam and working back from saying if this city has the ambition and is signing up for being fully decarbonized by 2030, but also a place where there is social justice, where there is well-being, where the future of work has been designed to not leave people feeling that they've been sacrificed for a climate agenda, then what do we need to change? And when you start to look at that, you're looking at, we need to do something about air quality, we've got to do something about rewilding, getting trees and green things and nature-based solutions back into our streets and our, our homes and our houses and our environment. We've got to change our assumptions about how we move about and our transport. We've absolutely got to change construction and the way we're thinking about buildings. But we, for example, have got an opportunity to think more creatively. We can use a whole set of advanced technologies on wood in construction to draw carbon down and store it in buildings and new structures. Europe today had a massive conference on the new, new European Bauhaus, and that is all about how do we regenerate the world by reforesting, using forestry and mixed land use to think about regeneration and change our entire notion of construction and design so that we put style and beauty and aesthetics together with nature-based solutions and sustainable construction, completely change the face of the way Europe lives. So I think here- That does sound great. And I, and I love I love this, you know, the, the vision, but I'm kind of a bit concerned that the information I get all the time about the state of the climate is so seriously bad and the outlook so terrible for the next 10 or 20 years or so that I feel that there's almost, you know, we, we, we're advancing very slowly with the change in the system. Meanwhile, climate change is just pushing on anyway. 
And it has, have people really understood that this, it, 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 do you feel there's a gap between those two things? Yes, very definitely. I remember, look, I, you know, when I stepped into starting to do this work seriously, I worked with a woman for a while who had been part of the Obama administration. And she said to me, one of the first things I was tasked with doing by Obama was to go and find out in the history of human of humans, where have really, really major shifts taken place and what catalyzed that. And she said, you know, I did a year's worth of work, over 3,000 worth years of history, every possible thing I could find, and I found two constant patterns. Either they got to a point of total crisis and finally the penny dropped and something happened, or somebody bold enough instituted a set of rules that really just changed the law but had the conditions in which to do that. And she said, my take on it is you're going to have to work on both. I'm my piece in this puzzle, if I look at from where we're standing, which is very, very close to the cities and to the agricultural farming communities whose livelihoods are drying up because the summers are too hot to keep producing because there's no more water because seasons are too unpredictable. That's now. That's not tomorrow. Mm. The, the problem is that to change, humans need to see the possibilities of alternatives because otherwise we can only take so much doom and gloom and then after a while we just go into look i don't know how to deal with this so i'll just focus on my thing here we, we need do. to see something different i was wondering whether i can try to bring a slightly more positive uh, i mean i know is, there is a lot of doom and gloom when we talk about climate but i think there is especially in europe also a different angle and, and an angle that we are seeing, I mean, you're talking about agriculture, you're talking about cities, you're, you're talking about afforestation. And we have seen also because of the consequences of, um, of extremes we have seen in, in recent years, uh, a number of these sectors actually tuning up and, and listening to, to not just the science, listening to the data and being quite uh, interested in, in, in doing more, in adapting their business, in their adapting their activities to climate variability, to climate change. And, and I think in Europe, we are in a very good position there to harvest that information, to improve our processes, to improve our planning. We are seeing in agriculture, we are seeing in insurance, we are seeing in, in transport, in, in so many different sectors, a, a novel way of dealing with climate data. Uh, and I guess uh, is part of the solution is for climate scientists and for climate uh, uh, producer of climate data to talk beyond the remit of, of climate science and really engage with society through a number of channels, certainly on the data layer. If I may, I think Carla, this is a, you're you're making a fantastic set of points and ones that are really really relevant. For example, to say the the European adaptation strategy, but what I do still see is a gap between the increasing quality of a supply of information on climate data, climate science, space, you know, satellite data and so on, and a gap with those who are holding the problem of decision making in, say, a demand perspective. So, say, governments and decision makers who should be using that information right now, you know, we've just, we've been working on the climate space, the Copernicus project and the, and the Marco project, of the businesses that were affected by climate, some form of climate change related effect, 90% of industry in Europe was affected by some form of climate change related effect in the last three or four years. Only 30% have actually done something about that using science-based information. So uh, there still is a gap between the kind of the demand and the supply. How do we join this up and get it used quickly and in real time? Sure, no, you, you're absolutely right there. Let's, let's bring in Tim on, on this one. Uh, what's the, the view from, from the commission on that and joining it up and making the kind of wholesale change that we've been talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think Kirsten make, makes a very good point that, you know, we, we need this this kind of not sector or this kind of horizontal approach. And I think that's that's really something that we're doing differently in Europe. And, you know, Bass will remember this well. He's, he's been around for, for a couple of mandates now. You know, in the in the past, the, the commission um, operated in silos and there was, you know, there, there was industry on one side. There was the green guys on the other side and everything was kind of piecemeal. And the thing that's, that's different now is that the, the European Green Deal cuts across everything. I think the document that the Commission put out 10 days into our mandate is, is something that's never been produced um, before by the European Commission. It really it shows this big kind of lifestyle change, structural change, systemic change that we need to make and shows how everything connects together. And this is what you'll see again with the proposals that we come up with in the summer. Everything kind of has a knock on effect on, on something else when you're talking about incentives for investing in renewables and infrastructure, the things that we were talking about earlier, putting prices and on how carbon. How soon though, before, before we start to see those 
become changes that we see around us here in, in you know, I live in, in Lyon in, in France. I see small changes, you know, a bike lane here or there, a couple of electric cars, but I don't see any systemic change. But I think that's that's accelerating. I think those are the kind of changes you see, you know, you, you mentioned Lyon, you could say the same for, for Brussels, for, for many other cities. These things, if you'd gone back five years, would have been unthinkable, you know, but you mentioned cycling infrastructure and that's one. You, you see the investments in public transport, you see, you know, solar panels coming on roofs, you, you know, you see these, the, these kind of investments that, that are happening around the cities. I, th I think there's a lot more awareness of them. And I think there's a lot more popular demand for them as well. And, you know, something as simple as, you know, organic food, bio food, you know, you see more and more of these kind of stores and, and offers popping up. So I think there's a real acceleration over the last couple of years. And you see bits and pieces of it. But if you take a, a step back, you know, three, four, five years, you know, there, there's big changes that we, that have kind of crept up on us and, you know, perhaps wouldn't have been Im imaginable back then. I'm just going to go to some of the questions and keep keep uh, sending them in. This is this is great. This one's on Twitter from X Metman. Uh, perhaps Sonia or Carlo can have a go at it, which is um, he is talking about the climate in Europe in 2021. Why have average global temperatures been falling since this time last year, which in fact they have? Well, we've certainly seen that with La, La Nina, I suppose. Um, Sonia? Well, I think Carlo actually already provided uh, an answer on this point, so I'll, I'll leave it to him. Okay, go on. Well, I guess it's, it's difficult to pinpoint to a, a single cause. Uh, you know, it, certainly La Nina uh, may have played a role, but so also these large anomalies that we've seen in uh, uh, in some of the season, in especially in recent months in uh, in northern latitude in the Arctic in Siberia, have contributed to this cooling down. But if you look at the time series of the global mean temperature of the last uh, five decades, let's say, the tendency towards uh, the rise is incredibly clear. There are fluctuations as you would expect, and the fluctuation we've seen over the last uh, few months is not unusual with respect to other fluctuations we've seen in uh, recent decades. We often get this question. Uh, thank you for and this one's on Instagram from C. Mamedzadi, who's asking what type of action should we take as individuals? What should an individual do? Uh, Bas, you're a politician, you're close to the people. What do you tell people to do when they want to be a bit more green? Well, first of all, I always tell them, yes, you can do little things, but really, I, I don't like the narrative to say, OK, it's down to the consumers, because that's probably the systemic change that we need. You can't expect from consumers that they change their behavior if you have the feeling that at the production level there is so much going wrong so that the most polluting products are the cheapest in the supermarket and in, in the shops. I mean, that's what needs to change. And then, of course, as a consumer, you can play your additional role. But I think as a consumer, most important is the drive for a more systemic change on our pricing policies. We are still not paying enough for the pollution. And that is then in the end brought up by the entire society. I mean, health costs, you don't see as an individual, but it's the entire society paying for it, which then later you as a taxpayer are paying for it. So there are so many things still going wrong in the way we deal with pricing. And Kirsten also said it already on that we are still subsidizing the use of fossil fuels also within Europe. Those kind of things are so wrong to do. I always When's find that it very finish, problematic. Dan? When's well, that going to finish? The well, here the biggest problem is, is that quite often that uh, the, the policies on taxation is still a decision by national member states. And this is exactly where things go wrong. And this is also why I said, you know, the EU, we can do some standard setting, target setting, a bit of pricing policies. But the big fundamentals on changing our tax system is a national competence. And also the room for investments, it's much more national than at the European level. And this is where our biggest problem lies. I sincerely have the feeling, and Tim also said it, there is a change at the European level. And yes, all the heads of state have signed this Green Deal and has signed the targets for 2050, but they still haven't really grasped what it means. That climate neutrality in 30 years' time means that each investment tomorrow needs to change, not in 10 years, not in five years. And that's where the heads of state are still not grasping the really urgency. And this is the challenge for Europe. Why, if we can't not? get why? the capitals of the member states, then we have a problem. Well, we, we see green mares in cities. We talked about cities a lot, and there is a lot of change on city level. Why is it national leaders in Europe are not getting it? 
Well, I can think I here, well, it's an it. Oh, Kirsten, no, no, you no, go no, ahead. Go, go. Kirsten, and then I'll follow. Well, I only wanted to say that you can see that in all the capitals that you have a kind of a polarized political system, whereas I see more change at the European level, I see more change at the local level. However, our way of dealing with politics is very dominated still by the national level. And exactly there you see the most polarized part of our politi political system. And I think that is one of our biggest problems. And, and Kirsten probably has a much more scientific explanation. No, I'm, in, I'm totally agreeing with you. I just want to get, put it into an example. Absolutely agree. So, for example, we're working in Silesia. Um, and I'm going to take the example of, uh, of a town that we're, a city we're working with, which is the city of Ribnik. Um, Ribnik is a city where the predominant uh, industry is coal mining. Um, and where there is a, an extreme tension with the fact that the surface of the earth is owned nationally and new mines are being planned and being put in, even though the city itself and its mayor is committed to exiting coal. So you've got a situation where it's, you've got generational challenges with older, uh, older generations really, really attached to a sense of the identity that comes with having a particular industrial activity, younger generations that are pushing hard to find alternatives, and a national construct which is actively undermining or working against the efforts to change. And what we're finding is the work that's making breakthroughs is work to patiently go through, and we've had over 3,000 conversations to just work through and help local communities ground up, build an alternative vision of different technologies, industries, work, um, sources of income, ways of, of rebuilding the city, and gradually push back upwards. But the disconnect at the national level is absolutely extreme. And we know that's everywhere. And the problem is precisely this, that we have a construct of nation states that for future generations has become obsolete. Uh, we're seeing it. And, you know, we are, I had a conversation recently actually about 70% of China's energy emissions are coming from Bitcoin mining, which if you start to think about it and you think about, you know, the next generation of problems we're going to have to deal with in terms of emissions. And one of the reasons why that is being is driven, one of the things that's affecting is the way in which it's driving a real breakdown in a sense of the value of, of national boundaries, nation states, fiat currencies for future generations, getting into crypto, kind of getting beyond the national system is, is an imperative. But then we've got to start thinking about, so how do we enable those communities to connect with each other and get stuff to happen really fast? I want to jump over to Sonia, who's um, uh, messaged me to say that she wants to talk something about reversing climate change and whether we're on course for 1.5 degrees of warming. Yeah, no, I just had a comment on this because you, you brought this up. To which extent can we reverse the current situation? And I think we should really get the message across. We cannot reverse it. As I said, CO2 stays in the air for hundreds to thousands of years. So the idea is that somehow you could go back at some point, this is not an option. I think we should just remember it. So basically things are getting worse and worse. Warming is increasing. So it's only a question of whether can you stabilize the global warming. You're going back, there is no going back. And this message needs to go across. And about the solution, I think one point we need to, to get across also is that it's mostly an energy problem. And, and the world without, I mean, with net zero would mean basically for instance, no fossil fuels, it's very easy. You have no petrol, no gas, no coal. That's the first thing. And there are still remaining emissions in other sectors. Yeah? When are we gonna see a coal-free Europe? Because you still have coal power stations working here to provide electricity, electricity in Europe. Tim? Well, I would say, yes. yeah. I would, I would say it should be by 2030. But here, for example, right. you see again the point, Germany, it's, it's a progressive country, but the coal phase out, they have plans for 2038. That's way too late, because how can we then look at Poland and say, you need to, uh, you need to phase out your coal, while Germany only does that by 2038. Then I don't have a good argument to say to Poland, you need fa to be faster than Germany. How can you do that? So here you also really see that countries like Germany need to step up their ambitions absolutely as well. I think the carbon price will certainly make it moving faster. But I think that at the national level, again, a couple of countries really need to have a drastic coal phase out. And I think if you look at the coal mines in Europe, Germany and Poland, those are the two most important countries where the steps need to be taken. 
it's it's um also one of those things where you feel there's a there's a kind of heavy inevitability about it um and i'd like to go back to what sonia was talking about relating to kind of the fact it's irreversible and you're an expert in climate extremes what does a kind of a two degree warming world look like because last year we had storm alex for example with record levels of rainfall in um in italy and france it really destructive um you know awful kind of storm i'm not saying that individual incident was definitely a climate thing but they say those sorts of things will be associated with climate change what does a two degree world look like here in europe what can we expect from that yeah, so there was a report from IPCC uh, two years ago, uh, basically on climate change on well, end of 2018 about uh, global warming of 1.5 degree. What we found was that there are substantial changes in climate at 1.5 degree versus 2 degree. So there would be much more hot extremes. There would be also much more heavy precipitation, which can lead to uh, inundations. And there would be also more risk of droughts. And there will be also some irreversible changes. So for instance, coral reefs already now are very much under pressure. I mean, we know at 1.5, it would be already very hard. And then two degree probably, you know, they wouldn't survive. And But there are also other irreversible changes that would happen for a lot of plants and animals uh, on basically on the earth. We know that there are already uh, staggering uh, levels of uh, uh, extinction and this would increase further. And once they are extinct, it's over. So, I mean, they are just some of some of, in, of the impacts are irreversible, and we're just taking this. You know, we, we should just remember this. And once maybe we realize, oh, we are really in a bad situation, it will be too late. Yeah. What What is the the point of view, I suppose, uh, at uh, at the European level about this kind of doom, and what does it mean? about our relationship with other parts of the world, to what extent can, can we in Europe take leadership and influence other um, countries to come with us on the journey? Um, Tim, talk to me a bit about that. I'm interested in, in how Europe is exchanging its ideas outside Europe. Yeah, well, I think um, the the point um, that Sonia was making there about the you know the the fact that some of this is is irreversible and, and we need to adapt to, to the future that's coming. We've we've talked a lot about the mitigation side of things, but adaptation is going to become increasingly important. And the Commission presented an adaptation strategy earlier this year, which looks at Europe, of course, um, but also um, our partners around the world, some that we will learn from uh, and some that we will share experiences with. You know, there, there's countries in, in Europe, um, low-lying countries, where there's a lot of good work that's been done in terms of managing, um, you know, water water level challenges, um, but there's also things that we're, we're learning about agriculture, how to adapt um, to the more extremes of weather, kind of what crops um, people will need to, farmers will need to think about uh, no, using to, to make sure they can keep producing food. But also at the Are, the we, kind of, are we investing the in adaptation though? Are we investing enough in adaptation, spending enough time and money and energy on it and saying, look, this is pretty inevitable. If you listen to the two scientists either side of me, it's going to happen. Uh, wh whatever we do, we might, you know, of course, we're going to reduce our emissions, but this warming is going to happen even if we reduce our emissions drastically now. Are we spending enough time on fixing things to be ready for to adapt? Well, I think it's a, it's a complex uh, answer. I, I, I think, think that's different. Sorry. Go on, Carla. No, go ahead, Carla. Well, I was just saying, I think there are several elements in that in that in the plan of adaptation and the mission of adaptation certainly goes in, in, in some way in that direction. But there are so many other facets. And for me, uh, one of the important ones is to ensure that the information is available and permeates the entire uh, society. So this means triggering ad adaptation in all in the fabric of society, triggering adaptation uh, at the uh, definition of standards. For instance, if you have to build a bridge, uh, how can you build a bridge that withstand uh, the one in 100 years events that will happen in 20 years, in 50 years time, not the one that was uh, based on, on the historical data. Uh, if yeah. you have to uh, build a new uh, wind farm, uh, where do you put it? How can you be sure that that wind farm will, will keep working in, in 20 years time and so on and so forth? So for me, in that, in that uh, space, in the space, of, if you want, of climate services, Europe has done already a lot and is in a, in a leadership position and should keep investing in, in that direction because it's, it, it will be an important currency in, uh, uh, in, the, in the, any plan and adaptation that we uh, would be put forward. Tim, go, ahead, go on. Yeah, no, I was, I was going to say, I think this is, um, this is an area where the economics, you, you asked if we're spending enough money. 
the economic messaging, I think, needs to get stronger and stronger. I think Sonia makes very well the the case for for the climate for our planet, um, but that doesn't appeal to everybody. Um, but what does appeal is is thinking about their their pockets for some people, and you know, this is something. It's already costing the European Union around 12 billion a year. Projections suggest that with a three three degrees Celsius um, warming, you could be losing 170 billion euros a year um, in the European Union, and that's something which speaks to to business, but also speaks to to governments, um, to you know, to the chancelleries in terms of the money that they need to put into to bailing out these problems. So, you know, this is something that you've heard from, from example, for Franz Timmermans. It's something that um, John Kerry said when he was here. In the commission a few weeks ago, you know the cost. Okay, it's what Boris Johnson was saying higher. yesterday with his uh, with his cake and eat it uh, comment, wasn't it? Is really that it it's a pro business choice to try and be in a uh, emissions reducing kind of green field of of uh, if you can, if you can move in that direction, that's the way to go. Yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe I could add, I mean, what's actually happening on the ground in this space because this is an area where European instruments like uh, like Climate Kick are working and have been working for some time. Um, there's a huge body of activity, as Carla was saying, on the whole question of how can you use uh, climate information, scientific information, evidence-based, particularly to create open data marketplaces, because if we can get open data and open standards, we can help businesses everywhere really start to access what they need. There's a very good example of something like the Oasis Hub on insurance or Icebreaker One uh, that is looking to leverage $3.6 trillion worth of investment in climate adaptation and mitigation understood as being connected. There's a lot of stuff in, in getting now activities now and businesses that are putting climate risk into credit and bond ratings. We've got landscape, we've got supply chain services, business models that are baking in adaptation responses. And there's also some very interesting work happening now in a lot of places on pro-resiliency regulatory pre-litigation strategies to try and help anticipate what's happening where you get crises around resources and access. How do we ensure that we don't get breakdowns in civil society and there are already rules in place or mechanisms to manage and arbitrage both governance and participation? I think the critical question that we're seeing is adaptation is the key to help people accelerate into mitigation because it's the point right. at which change becomes real, really real, um, but the uh, same learning, it has to bring together multiple actors. It's really got to assume this is not an industry problem or a political problem or a local community. They all have to work together. And the one, you know, if I just think about what is Europe doing that is different in terms of the rest of the world, think GDPR. What markets need to change and governments need to change and communities need to change is a predictable context to work towards. And if you set up really strong policy and consistent policy and legislation, you create that predictability, no matter how disruptive it is. That is something that Europe is really majoring on. Now we've got to actually follow through and get the implementation up to anything like the same scheme, that that's a thing we can lead on, really lead on. Bas, go, go on. I'm sure you've got things to say on that topic. No, well, I, I think I think uh, Kirsten is absolutely right here. That's that's also Europe is known for it. Eh? What is the power of Europe? It's it's quite often setting the standards, and I think Europe has that capacity uh, capability. But we need to do so, it. But, we. But what about carbon? Carbon yeah. pricing, for example, you were talking about pollution earlier, and and or pricing carbon into things, the consumer products and things. What when's that going to start happening? Well, it is already. Be happening. It is already happening. If you look we don't at the feel it. emission we don't trade, feel it strongly. Well, you know, why would you need to feel it? You as a consumer, if you can get a cleaner product and you hardly notice a price difference, that's that's brilliant. So that's that's, that's even better. The industry is feeling it. I mean, I am a parliamentarian. I get the European energy intensive industry almost at a daily basis at my desk they feel the carbon pricing, that it doesn't always exactly re translate into a consumer price, I would say is even better. I think where we are having a big problem, and this is also a bit relating it to, or let's say, challenge, and it's, this is related also to the adaptation points, it's of course our agriculture system. Our agriculture system where prices and consumers can have a more immediate effect, plus also that system needs to adapt to, to a much more extreme climate system. And I think there we still have a big problem that the current agriculture policies of Europe 
are not changing. It's the same old, same old discussions I've seen for decades now. And the attempts also by the commission to put uh, the farm to fork strategy on the table to change the entire food chain. The first reactions until now of the classic agriculture lobbyists don't. It's too, too, dis it's too disturbing. Don't do it and don't bother us. Well, that attitude needs to change and has to change. Well, another question we just had from uh, Adu Hadu, who um, says it's more of a, a remark than a question. Um, and uh, they're saying there should be one, um, one influential organization that's really kind of, they say, considering the environment. I guess that means like managing environmental questions on an international level. I suppose the UN believes that it does that. I suppose the European Commission believes that it does that. But it, it um, what do you have to say about that? I suppose um, bringing in, in Tim, to what extent do we see real leadership coming from the UN and to what extent are things watered down? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think we also, I mean, this idea of one big organization is, you know, it's nice to think that somebody would take charge and fix everything, but it's, you know, Every, it has to happen at every level of governance. It has, has to happen at the international level through the, the COP process, the UN. It has to happen at EU level, national government, local government, regional government. So, you know, I think everybody has a, has a role to play and, you know, has a contribution to make. You know, the, the European Union sets standards, sets policies, sets targets, which then the member states implement because they, they're closer to their citizens. And then, you know, the regional and local levels um, do that as well. So I think this idea that there should be one person that's responsible, one body is, you know, it's probably a little bit too paternalistic. I mean, I, I, I see the um, I see where the where the question is coming from, um, mm, yeah. but I think it's it's you know one size fits all doesn't really work in, in this kind of situation. I'm I'm just going to go a little bit back to what I was just talking about with with Bass because we had a question reacting from uh, Wadora who's saying as a consumer I'd still like to know how the process is working I suppose having some transparency I'm, and I'm and I'm particularly thinking about imported goods from outside the EU and being able to say well what was the emissions uh, figure on this product that I'm buying from from another country from from uh, I don't know Latin America or from uh, Southeast Asia um, no, but absolutely. absolutely. Just, absolutely. We've just funded. Sorry, Sorry Bess, go on. No, you go first now, Kirsten. No, I was, I was going to say, we've just literally funded a couple of fantastic new businesses that are going to be offering in Europe exactly that. Literally every single product you buy is going to say, this is exactly where this supply chain has come from. This is the carbon footprint, so you can make a different choice. Now, is that going to drive enough change? No, I really agree with Tim. This is. I think there's a question here about governance models do we want to we're talking about needing to change almost every aspect of our lives do we want one big governance body in the world to tell us to do that or do we need to accept that our existing governance systems have to help us change that at every single point including individual choices in every supermarket basta talk to us a bit about this um, question of products and their their kind of carbon yeah. footprint no and I think this is still one of the parts where the Green Deal needs to be improved, and that's that's our trade agenda. I mean, the European Union is also powerful as a market to the outside world. We are a very attractive market for, for a lot of countries in the world, and we are at the same time dealing with a lot of trade agreements, and we are negotiating that right now. I think our Green Deal has still not landed sufficiently in those negotiations. I mean, sustainability... It's in the trade deals that we see, but it's really, it's chapter 15, 16, and it's voluntary from A to Z. So it's, it's, it's really where the Green Deal needs to change is in those trade agreements where trade, which can be pursued, but it should always be trade to improve our environmental and social standards. And it has been until now too much at the cost, right? You trade and then even at a World Trade Organization, they are talking about an environmental measure as a barrier to trade, which they mm -hmm. could agree upon, but only the term already, barrier to trade, tells you there's something fundamentally wrong in how the trade organizations are looking at this. That needs to change 
still also within the European Union, and that also will then allow us that we are improving our production chain, not only within Europe, because yes, we are doing that, but we have to be honest, we have been exporting a lot of production outside Europe and then importing the products only. So also we need to improve our production outside Europe. We can do that with trade. We can do that with transparency throughout the production chain. And of course, we can also be a bit more aggressive on protecting our European borders. And that's where also this carbon border adjustment discussion is coming, because I think the old idea of Europe, you know, trade, it should be liberalized and made free. We are fortunately coming a bit back from that. I'm going to take a, a question. We, we had two questions, and I'll group them together from uh, Nicola Todi on Instagram, um, uh, who is asking about uh, what's being done to make air travel greener, and then what are the strategies in Europe to promote train travel over air travel here in Europe? I know in France they have one uh, uh, to promote train travel. Um, uh, Tim, maybe you have something to say about that? Yeah, so I mean, I, you, you mentioned that the French policy, which was announced in you know a few weeks ago, to to cut out uh, domestic flights when there's um, rail alternatives available, and that's actually something that we proposed um, when we presented our, our mobility strategy back in December, that we would work towards that and seeing um, journeys of under 500 kilometers um, having that switch from from air travel to to rail, and of course, there's you know there's a lot of Work that needs to be done at national level. There's still um, questions of of synchronizing the the rail network, but that's definitely something that the the Commission is putting a lot of focus on. We've you know we've we've dedicated this year 2021 to be the European Year of Rail, uh, and there's a lot of focus on that. You know, it's a it's a very low polluting um, form of transport, and you know, look for freight, but also, also for a nice way to travel. <laughs> It's also a nice way to travel. Not so many, not so many of those awful um, security controls, etc. But yeah, I mean, but we, we, is that possible? Is that the sort of thing that the European Commission could say? Okay, we need to do this so that I can jump on a train in Zurich and zoom up to uh, Amsterdam easily. And um, in fact, it's very difficult for me to get a plane. Can you kind of make that happen, or do you need to be open to the market forces? Well, I think we can. You know, we can certainly nudge the market forces in that direction and we can encourage um, national governments. But it's, you know, it's some of the the simpler things that we can do, which is kind of standardization um, in terms of the the tracks. You know, you still have have issues with, with cross-border train and rail in some places in Europe. But it's things that we can encourage in terms of ticketing platforms, that there's a lot more kind of interconnectivity uh, between planes and trains. And, and these are areas where, you know, we a lot of what we can do in this area is, is nudging, obviously, but you know that that has an influence when we do that, and when national governments and and the industry and the operators um, get on board, you know, there, there's certainly an interest from from the rail sector to get more people on their trains. I'm sure there is. I'm, uh, I'm thinking of nudging. Question from SR Dane, who's saying, are there going to be tax breaks or incentives for newer businesses and investors with regards to sustainable business in the future? Um, a, there are plenty of those, I suppose, in certain countries. But is there a cohesive European view on that? Tim, maybe. Uh, on, on encouraging tax breaks or incentives for sustainable businesses. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about taxation, it, as Bas mentioned earlier, this comes very much down to, to national governments. Um, you know, there is European Energy Taxation Directive, and we're looking into uh, to revisions of that this year as well. Um, but yeah, kind of startup incentives is, is probably more of a, a national government thing. But I mean, one, one thing that I wanted to mention, um, you know, you, you were talking about um, price, seeing the, the price of carbon, but I mean, on the flip side, there is incentives to consumers for, for greener choices. And you see a lot of member states um, introducing discounts, for example, on electric cars, um, national governments and regional governments um, putting in place um, measures to help to encourage people to get solar panels, for example, on, on their homes. So these are the kind of things, you know, not just business, but as individuals where there's there's fiscal tools, there's there's financial incentives to help people go a bit greener. Kirsten. Can I just say on the tax yeah. breaks? Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go on. Yeah, just thought because, um, of course, it's, it's good to, uh, to support uh, startup, etc. But be a bit careful with tax breaks because it's quite difficult later on than not to have those tax breaks anymore. I mean, once you have them, it's, it's difficult Oh, 
Bass appears to have gone. Oh dear, the Wi Fi's given out on him. Let me bring in Kirsten, who's still there. <laughs> are you still there, Kirsten? I am. It's the witching hour. Uh, certainly, at least I know this is when my kids are back from school and they're hopping oh, on the Wi Fi. Yeah. Um, I was just, I was just thinking, I, I actually would just build a little bit on what Baz was saying in terms of um, being very careful on, but be very careful what you wish for if you're thinking also about this is, we need to make moves that help and accompany and support long term change. Um, some of what we've started to, to explore or we have been exploring and seeing works is just shifting in some sense also the structural model. So, for example, in construction, one of the challenges is it costs about 60 or 70,000 euro to retrofit a European kind of an average domestic home so that it is carbon, it's, it's really, really carbon efficient. Um, not that many people necessarily have 70K sitting around that they're able and willing to. But one of the financial innovations we've been looking at is lend that money to the house, not to the owners, um, because houses change ownership. It can be vested with the house once the house is, is actively um, not only carbon neutral, but potentially also looking at al al alternatives for generating zero emissions or for storing energy and so on. That benefit can be accrued back into the house itself. So it's a relatively simple construct, but it suddenly opens up the possibility for quite a big acceleration in the way in which people you know, pick up things and you don't get into this sort of slight cargo cult on tax breaks that is still a really, really, really short-term solution that's not solving the structural choice. I've got to, um, We're going to run out of time soon. Quickly, though, um, Kieran uh, is asking Carlo, uh, what role could Earth observation data in general play to inform EU climate policy going forward? I'm guessing that Kieran must work in the um, Earth observation sector. Well, uh, you know, the Copernicus program is an Earth observation program, so I'm a bit biased uh, in that respect. But there is no doubt that in order to build a, a good policy for the future, an adaptation or a mitigation policy, we need to start from solid ground. And the solid ground in this case are, are solid data. We are fortunate in Europe to have uh, a program such as the Copernicus program, but also many other uh, European programs working on climate to provide this data and the data is freely available for anyone to, to use. So, I mean, the Copernicus license means that all the data that we make available to the user is free for any sort of application, commercial or, or research. And at the moment we have 80,000 users and counting uh, of that data set and we deliver to them something in the order of 80 terabyte per day. So there is a market, there is an interest, and this is, is, is going way beyond academia, is re reaching out in all, in, all, in all sectors. So yes, a very big uh, role for, uh, for Earth observation to play. Um, and you, you see it even with this, uh, uh, the state of the climate. If you look at the anomalies that we've seen, there's been a, an extraordinary transition, for instance, early in the year from a, a very wet start. If those of you who were in the UK, uh, last winter, probably remember a very wet start of the of, of the of the 2020, and then more or less when the lockdown started, there was a spectacular switch towards a much nicer and uh, more palatable climate to, to many of us, and this was uh, immediately visible on on our satellite. You can see in the way the vegetation grows, and you you can see it in the, in the soil moisture, you can see in the river discharge. Um, having this comprehensive view of the climate system is something that satellite allow you to do, and uh, and so I think it's, it will be vital to maintain and and enhance uh, that sort of uh, capability that, that Europe is already leading on. I, I'm gonna I'm going to wrap it up soon, but I want to bring up um, one of the graphics. In fact, that really caught my eye from from your report. In fact, and related to this, because we do remember the sunshine when we were all sitting around at home last year, and we're having a little bit of the same now. Um, let's bring up the the graphic for and this is this is just a bit of a fun moment at the end of this live. Let's have a look at the sunshine situation in Europe last year. Did you know? It was seriously an awful lot sunnier in Switzerland last year than average. You can see that big um, kind of purpley red area there right across the middle. And um, I don't really know what to make of that, actually, um, Carlo or Sonia, when I look at that. Um, but it was one of those things I thought, we have to share this with everybody. Look at Indeed. this graph and say, look, it's it was a lot sunnier last year. Is this is this climate change? Is it going to be sunnier? Well, first of all, I think that we need to put a, a small caveat. I think it was sunnier for most of the European, but if you were in the Iberic Peninsula, you probably think otherwise. Not and that's so much, in, in the details. Um, 
It, it was, and and when we presented the report last year, probably there was a similar news because, because actually these events, so the the sunny twenty twenty, is not isolated. There is a tendency in Europe towards a sunnier uh, uh, climate, less uh, less clouds and and more sunshine hour. Um, we understand it part of it, but I think there is still a lot we don't understand of, of those tendency, and so we need to do more research into into uh, into that. But it's certainly a, a good uh, a good signal and uh, something we, we are happy with. Uh, Sonia. But maybe if I can add, I think it's not all good in the sense that it's also basically associated with uh, more heat wave and uh, hot days. And so, for instance, uh, last year we had a very extensive uh, drought period also in the spring. So part of the beginning was nice, but then afterwards there were also consequences of this. Yeah, I mean, and we have, as Carla was saying, we have all of this information now. We understand our planet so much more, particularly in the last um, couple of decades since the satellite age. We really know more about ourselves and, and what we're doing to it. Um, our last one uh, is a question, I suppose, that was answered by a rather famous um, teenage, uh, which was asked by a, a, uh, by a teenage um, climate campaigner you're probably aware of yesterday in a message to all of the world leaders, which is, she was basically saying, uh, Greta was saying the, the window is still open. My question to, to you is, do you think the window is still open to reach a 1.5 degree um, warming period and to round it off there and not carry on? Or do you think that that window is pretty much shut now? Is it a question to be? <laughs> Go ahead, Sonia. Yeah, okay. Well, I think the the yeah, the door is still open, but it's closing down. I mean basically uh it's closing up and um yeah, we don't have a lot of time and I mean we know what we need to do. This was the conclusion of the IPCC special report on 1.5. We need at least to have uh, you no know, reduction of uh, emissions by half until 2030. Now there have been some declarations. We have not seen really reduction so far. I mean, I'm still waiting to see something happening in terms of the emissions. So yes, it's nice to have declarations, but as we said, I mean, this is not just small measures. We need a radical change and I'm waiting to see it. It has not happened yet. I hope it's going to happen now because it needs to happen now if you want to keep this chance open there. Yeah. Anybody else have anything to say on that? Well, well I think, so I think there's two sides to this from my perspective. Uh, we know that we're likely to hit 1.5 around about 2030. Um, so if you think about that, then you think about that would actually mean we need to decarbonize by 2030, 35 completely because as Sonia was saying, just because we stop carbon emissions doesn't mean that, the, that the, the degrees of CO2 and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere go away. They don't. Now, if you look at that and you think now we're in 2021, you think about political processes, social processes, the, the tensions we've been talking about between member states, cities, the sense of which people are aware of information but not necessarily using it. Is that possible? It, everything is possible. Is it likely? No. Um, but if I answer as a mother and I answer as somebody working in climate innovation, it must be possible or at least we have to keep telling ourselves this is a thing we have to do and as that window closes, we're going to get more and more aware of just how serious it is, we speed up. So I am an absolute believer in the power of human ingenuity. I'm a believer in the power of panic um, but I'm also a believer in the problem of panic is if you have nothing to hold it and hold it well, and manage that transition, it turns to chaos. So I don't think we can afford to even ask ourselves whether the door is no longer open. We have to bust it open, but we have to know that it's a question, it is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Thank you, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Thank you, it's been a fascinating discussion. We've jumped around all over the place. Thanks for all of the questions. It's been so rich and diverse and interesting and I feel like I've learned a lot. So um, uh, please, Click on to uh, euronews.com slash climate now to watch the um, other episodes of um, Climate Now on TV and also to watch some of our debates as well like this on YouTube and learn more about climate, have a look at the data and hear from the scientists and the, the people who are in policy making and the people who are in business as well because we've got lots of interesting insights there. I'd like to say then thank you to all of our guests. So uh, Bas Aykut, who's a member of the European Parliament and 
a Dutch politician from the Green Left Party, Dr. Kirsten Dunlop, CEO of the EIT Climate Kick, and Dr. Carlo Buontempo, Director of the Copernicus Climate Change Service, Tim McPhee, Spokesperson for Climate Action and Energy at the European Commission, and Professor Sonia Seneviratni from the Institute of Atmospheric and Climate Science at ETH Zurich and IPCC co-author. Thank you all. It's been really excellent having a chance to talk to you. Thank you very much and um, hopefully see you soon. Thank you.